mission of FSU Coach is to prepare and equip the next generation of coaches and sports professionals with best practices and current research to enable them to pursue excellence. We have two academic programs, the online graduate certificate, which is four classes, and also a 10 class master's in athletic coaching. Our graduate certificate and master's program can be started at any time, either the, the summer, fall, or spring. The types of classes that we offer focus on the athlete as a whole person. We focus on the theory and practice, the research, the helping skills. I came to FSU Coach because I truly believed in the mission and the purpose of the program. I think I have my dream job being a head coach at Florida State, but I know there's always more ways that I can help my athletes and better prepare as a coach. If you're interested in going into coaching or joining the FSU Coach program, I would just say don't even think about it and do it. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Coaches Clinic. This is a collaboration between FSU Coach and USYS. Uh, a big thank you to everybody who's helped make this event possible. Tom uh, Condone, of course, and Christian Fuentes, who's been behind the scenes. Big thank you to, to being there and helping make sure everything runs smoothly. Last presentation of this clinic, and we're going to get going really quickly. It is mine. And I want to talk about what successful coaches and athletes teach us about successful leadership. This is something I'm very interested in. And if you have questions, put them in your chat box. I'll try and answer them at the end of the, the session. But we're going to go through this uh, as quickly as possible. I've got a lot to cover. Here we go. A little about me. Uh, I grew up in uh, a variety of different countries. I've been to several schools, colleges, and universities around the world. Uh, been married to my wife, Terry Lee, for 18 years, have a son, Asa and Asher. Asher's birthday this weekend, and happy birthday, buddy. He turns 12. We have a Cocker Spaniel, Hershey, and a Rabbit, Hokey. And we also have a Gator at the bottom of our yard who likes to um, hang around. Played a lot of racquetball, especially in my 20s and 30s, and uh, now playing a lot more pickleball and squash 57. I coach all of those sports. I also have a small business called Sports Performance Consulting, where I work with coaches and sports organizations to, to help mentor them to improve areas of need. Big fan of traveling, exploring and learning and a little factoid. I grew up actually in West Africa. I spent five years in Liberia and four in Ivory Coast. Well, leadership in sports is interesting because a lot of the, the leadership psychology comes from business. We learn from business psychology. It was applied to sports psychology as we know it today. And now what we're seeing is people using sports psychology, what we learn in sports, to apply now into business. And so what do we know about sports psychology? What do we know about leadership in that realm? How can we use it to make us better leaders in our sports? There's a lot of different tests you can do. And, and I did one here called the Strength Finder. And it found out that I was an achiever, analytical. I was a learner and I was responsible Everybody has strengths and weaknesses within their leadership style. But one of the interesting things is there's no perfect leader where we can all be leaders regardless of who we are, regardless of our backgrounds, our, our characteristics, our demographics. So that's something that we, we have to hold on to. We can all be great leaders. But leadership really begins at the top. It begins with you as a leader. And you may hear some of these such as you're only good as your weakest athlete or, or employee. You're only as good as your worst client. So if I asked you in these situations, let's say your athlete, um, imagine this athlete providing feedback about your team or business to somebody else. What would they actually say? Um, would they make a commitment? I've got this coach and they actually have it. Uh, it's really down to your leadership. What would they look like if they were the front piece of your poster for your business or your club or your team? And really leadership goes all the way down and it starts with you and passes through all of the, the components of your organization. So I wanna talk about what actions build a legacy and I hope you get my leadership picture, right? Leadership, um, I try, give me, give me some, I've tried. Uh, but I want to go through 24 different things. I had 23. I came up with my 24th today. But I'm going to go through 24 different things that actually help determine leadership ability, helps build us as leaders. OK, 
Okay, so we're going to go through these individually here in a second. The first one is that they, they lead by serving. And there's a quote here that uh, I co-wrote, servant leadership begins with a heart that seeks to minister to the needs of others. And through this service, people follow. Servant leaders focus on how to help their followers achieve established organizational goals. They're both authentic and ethical and enhance followership, followership, followership through unique leadership characteristics. This is my philosophy, and it's, it's asking the question, how can I help my athletes or whoever I'm working with succeed or fulfill their needs, desires, and concerns? What do they need the most? This is a challenge for a lot of coaches because a lot of coaches place themselves in a position where winning and losing is important, and it's probably the most important thing. And so it becomes about what you need the most, which are wins. And you may, as a consequence, place other things in front of caring for the needs of the athletes that you're working with. A good example, top right, is, is just, are you willing to go pick up the trash after, after a game? Uh, are you willing to do that or are you too big for that? Servant leadership says you're not too big for that. You can do it. Uh, so number two, leaders serve by leading. Well, part of servant leadership means that you also still have to lead. You have to make decisions that are difficult. When do you cut or sub or player? What if you, um, what if you have an ethical situation? How do you do that? You have to make hard choices. And you may have seen this in a philosophy class called the trolley problem. It came from the, the 60s of you are this person at a switch and you see a trolley uh, coming towards two groups. You see it's heading towards the group with the most people. Do you flip the switch to save the innocent or to kill the innocent person, but save the five? Um, it's it's or, you know, on the right, it was, you know, do you push, <laughs> believe it or not, do you push this person off the bridge to derail the train or trolley to save the five? It's it's a hard choice. It's a hard choice. What would you do? Well, leaders have to make hard choices. Number three, they need to set the example. And I love this quote. It was originally attributed, uh, attributed to Aristotle, but uh, it was actually comes from somebody called Durant in the 20s. Excellence is, one, is an art won by training and habituation. We not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but rather have these because we have acted rightly. These virtues are formed in man by doing his actions. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Do we have those habits? And I love uh, Dr. Seuss here. I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. Are we faithful in saying what we'll do? For example, if we tell a player, hey, uh, this season, I'm going to make sure that you get 50% of the games. Do you actually see that through? Because if you don't, you are not setting the example and that player is going to struggle to deal with that. So you have to practice what you preach and accept that failures happen with the expectation that they can lead to success. This is Pat Summit. Uh, she said, this may come as a surprise, but when I'm challenged, I can be a little excessive. I didn't lose 10 pounds. She was trying to compete for the Olympic team again. I didn't lose 10 pounds or even 15 in the next year. I lost 27. There were no more barbecues, 35 cent beers. I swore off red meat. I got up every morning, ran for miles. And if I didn't get my mileage in, I ran double the next. I trained five to six hours a day. After I ran, I went to the weight room and then to the gym to play pickup guys uh, against guys. I worked with total commitment, determined to be in the shape of my life at the USA trials. This, by the way, was while she was coaching at Tennessee. So she was doing this as an athlete, trying to meet, make the U.S. team, but also doing all this other stuff as coach. And so she's setting the example for her players. She wants something. She goes to get it. Her players can, too. Uh, Nick Saban, here's a great one. He said, What's, what you do speaks so loudly, loudly, I can't hear what you say. It's a quote that's resonated with me for many years and sums up my attitude pretty well. There are doers who exude positive energy and have the toughness to work hard, persevere, overcome adversity, and take great pride in their work. There are others who can always give you a reason why they don't get it, don't get it right. It's not uncommon that a player confronted about some responsibility he didn't attend to responds with nothing more than a justification for his failings. 
Be a doer and let your accomplishments speak for you, not your excuses. So leaders must set the example by being the doer. And I, I use this as an example. On the right here are my titles. Those are the letters that actually are supposed to go after my name. But on the left are, are things that I put up on my wall. In my office, I don't actually have any diplomas. I put up some of my medals, maybe some of my um, some of the sporting events I've been able to, to attend or work at. And for me, that carries more weight for students than pieces of paper. And, and I use that as an example of I've been there, I've done it, and I've succeeded. And it gives me a little bit more, uh, shall we say, respect than, oh, Dr. Baggers has a lot of diplomas on his wall. I don't really know what they are, or what they mean. Um, so that's, that's how I try to show to students coming in that this is something that I took seriously, too, as an athlete and as a coach. Uh, leaders must also have core values. And this was a, a business I used to have called Goat Sports Performance. And I created core values that, that mimicked the, the phrase goat, guidance, organize, achievement, and truth. And when I worked with a client, I would sign this and I would give this to the client because I had to make sure they held me accountable just as I held them accountable. Um, it's important that you as a coach have values and that your athletes know it too. We must instill them too. And these four things, trust, compassion, stability, and hope are four things that employees need to keep them at a job. And notice that, by the way, money isn't in there. Those are the top four things uh, according to a massive survey of employees. Well, we probably want to see those in our team too. And I, I like to see this idea of mudita, which is, it comes from, uh, from the East and, uh, and implies this idea of being happy at the success of others rather than just focused on our own success. And here you can see I'm with some of our graduates uh, from a while ago. And, you know, I want to share in that. I want to uh, be happy for their achievement. We also need to create a successful culture. Well, how do we do it? Well, we need to create the culture. The culture drives and sustains behavior and that sustained behavior produces results. But if we don't create the culture, none of that other stuff is going to happen the way we want it. How do we do it? Well, look on the right. These are the core values I asked of the clients that I worked with. Um, most of them were athletes. And so we had things about never quitting, working hard to improve, being punctual, not complaining, um, being gracious in, in winning and defeat, etc. But building a culture goes, goes about when we see decisions that are made when no one's watching. We have a blueprint. We're willing to accept mistakes on the, on the condition that we learn from them. We have to believe in the culture ourselves. We have to convince others of this culture. They have to buy into it. We have to recognize that if somebody does something against that culture and we permit it, then we're also promoting it. It's okay because we did nothing about it. So we build a culture and then results come as a byproduct of that culture. By the way, results can be bad if the culture is poor too. If the culture is toxic, you can expect the results to be toxic or, or negative as well. Um, this is somewhere I grew up in Ivory Coast. This is called the Basilique. And it's this massive um, church, Catholic church. And you can see some pictures here. I mean, it's, it is beautiful. It is actually larger than the Vatican, uh, believe it or not. And it's in the middle of Yamasucro in Cote d'Ivoire. But we as leaders need to see the big picture because the pictures you're seeing are the pictures I saw from where I lived. And we see poverty. And, and this is one of the, the quotes that came about with the, the Basilique. While the people of Yamasucro are living in slums and struggling to survive, here's the Basilica uh, towering over the horizon waiting to air condition the 7,000 people who will never come. We as leaders, we can't get caught up with what's going on in the, the micro. We also have to see the macro. We have to see the bigger picture. We also need to train the next generation. And, um, you know, the, the Bible is important to me. And, and I read this a while ago. I was reading through at the Old Testament and saw this. I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Joshua 24, 31. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him, 
and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Now let's see Judges 2.10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. When nobody taught that next generation, and so that generation grew up without that knowledge. So as leaders, we have a responsibility to prepare those, whether it be assistant coaches, employees, whether it be athletes, we have to prepare them to succeed when we step away. Some companies, some CEOs, some coaches actually kind of prepare for the program to fail when they leave. Why? Because then it becomes all about them. Oh, look, Tim left that program. They were hugely successful. That program's terrible now. Tim must have been amazing. That's not what a great leader does. A great leader trains the next generation so that program continues to be amazing. Leaders pass it on. Here's uh, uh, Jean-Luigi Buffon, one of the greatest goalkeepers of all time. Um, phenomenal. He said this in a show called First Team Juventus. Until the last day I'll play, I want to give all of myself to Juventus on and off the pitch to make sure things go well for Juve. And I hope to have passed on the important values to the ones who will come after me. That's a leader. That's somebody trying to pass something on. Leaders don't make excuses. Here's Grover. He's, he's, um, he was Michael Jordan's performance coach. Everyone is given some ability at birth. Not everyone finds out what that ability is. At the same time, there are abilities you are not given. Our challenge in life is to use the abilities we have and to compensate for the abilities we don't. I know countless athletes who are blessed with incredible gifts, height, skills, uh, strength, speed, but no work ethic or no support system, no way to use or develop or take advantage of those skills. Successful people compensate for what they don't have. Unsuccessful people make excuses, blame everyone else, and never get past the deficiencies. A true leader can see past those deficiencies, identify the abilities, and get the most out of that individual. So it's not highlighting the deficiencies, it's recognizing them and then focusing on what they can do. And I, I pulled this out and I, I created this myself and I, I love this because we have three different options or two different options here. We can blame, explain or complain, or we can refrain, confess and possess. One leads to mediocrity, one leads to improvement. If I make, if a player makes a mistake and I as coach say, hey, what happened? If that player starts blaming someone else, if they start explaining it away or they start complaining about something, we're going to mediocrity because they don't own it. And we have to draw a line in the sand where we say, no, we're not going that way. We don't blame others. We confess what we did wrong and we own it. Because if we do that, then we can work to improve it. So we draw a line in the sand. We get better every day. I'm not going to read all these quotes, but here's some great ones. Wooden success comes from knowing what that you did your best to become the best that you're capable of becoming. Wayne Gretzky, the highest compliment that you can pay me is to say that I work hard every day, that I never dog it. Um, they work to improve every day. They also continually train. Um, Grover, again, the greats never stop learning. Instinct and talent without technique just makes you reckless like a teenager driving a, a powerful high-performance vehicle. Instinct is raw clay that can be shaped into a masterpiece if you develop the skills that match your talent. That can only come from learning everything there is to know about what you do. So what can you do? There's workshops. There's certifications. I, I'm at FSU Coach. That's what we provide. Mentors. Finding a mentor. That's what I do with Sports Performance Consulting. Hiring a consultant, interviewing others, listening, asking questions, investing in yourself. That's what leaders do. They continually train. Uh, I like this one as well. They kind of embrace the suck. And what I mean by this is that it's a day-to-day -day grind. There's days where we just don't have it. We don't feel good. We're not motivated, but we grind through it. It's not one-off heroic efforts. It's not this idea of, well, today I had a great day. I can take tomorrow off. And I don't mean off in terms of having a rest day. I mean just doing nothing because I did a lot yesterday. This is relentless effort to get better. Uh, again, Grover, to be the 
best, whether in sports or business or any other aspect of life, it's never enough to just get to the top. You have to stay there and then you have to climb higher because there's always somebody right behind you trying to catch up. Most people are willing to settle for good enough. But if you want to be unstoppable, those words mean nothing to you. Being the best means engineering your life so you never stop until you get what you want. And then you keep going until you get what's next. And then you go for even more. Relentless. And I like this quote by Ledbetter on the side, winners fail, losers hide. Well, we can lose, but still win, right? We have to recognize that if we lose, how do we make up? How do we deal with that? If our team doesn't perform the way we want to, are we going to hide from that? Or are we going to own it and move forward? So we kind of embrace that. I have to do this. I'm just going to do it because I want to get better at what I want to do. Uh, they take time to think. Most people don't like thinking, believe it or not. Um, keep something handy to, to take notes. I have a, a note section on my phone. If I have an idea, I jot it down. You also have to turn off. When I drive my car, I don't put, I don't put my um, radio on. I just have the, the, the silence to allow me to think. Use imagery. Michael Jordan, obstacles don't have to stop you. If you run into a wall, don't turn around and give up. Figure out how to climb it, go through it, or work around it. You've got to think in order to do that. You can't, it's not just going to come. It is understanding a problem, thinking about that problem, and then figuring out a way to overcome that problem. So find time to actually shut down and just be at peace with yourself to allow yourself to think, and it will give you ideas and so on. Uh, I'm not going to read this, but uh, we have to think of what's possible. If you're watching this on YouTube later, just pause it. You can read it. But it's, it's about your mindset, believing that we can do something rather than assuming that we can't. We demonstrate efficiency. This is called Eisenhower's Matrix. And I found this a few years ago. I really like it. Eisenhower came up with this. He was well known for being efficient with his time. We have to decide when we're doing work whether it's urgent and important, important but not urgent, not important but urgent, and not important and not urgent. So when we're looking at our day, we're trying to get things done. How do we get things done? Are we kind of just doing things as we think about them? Or do we have a plan? Have we determined what we need to get done today first? We have to be efficient with our time. Um, I love this as well. Time is a precious commodity. It can be spent or invested. Choose well. And that's very true. I, I, a pro athlete once told me that, that time was this commodity for him because he only had so many years left of his career. So he wanted to make the most of them, which meant he had to use his time wisely. Number 18 is an interesting one. The leaders need to understand their personal gravity. So think about everybody having gravity, just like the moon or just like the earth. And if we have a strong gravity, it pulls people towards them. So we can use that as, as a way to get things done, right? To grow something. Um, it pulls everybody in the same direction as well. If we have that gravity, we can get people within that gravity. We can get them to, to work together maybe with the same philosophy or the, the same style of play or whatever. But we have to recognize it's a balance. If we have too much, we take away decision-making and control. We become micromanaging and we kind of create that culture of fear. If it becomes all about everybody's drawn into me. But if we don't have any, if it's loose, then we don't really have direction. And then people start to do what they want rather than all working on the same page. There isn't that accountability. And I love this quote about Westbrook. Um, it was by a reporter and it said, this is when he was at the Thunder. In past seasons, when Westbrook sat, on, uh, when he sat from playing, the Thunder dove headfirst off a cliff. So much of that had to do with the gravity Westbrook carries and how much he did for everyone around him that when he went to the bench, nobody knew how to play without him. His gravity was so much that it took away the decision-making and it created almost that culture of fear where players were no, you shoot, you shoot because Westbrook isn't on our team. So we need to understand we have that personal gravity. We also recognize that we need to surround ourselves with greatness. And on the right here is a, a, 
football tree of Bill Walsh and how he, uh, uh, Marty Schottenheimer and also Bill Parcells, where we can see how they surrounded themselves with great assistant coaches who went on to become great head coaches too. And Bill Belichick said, always bring in people who can enhance what you do without changing the basics of it. And that takes humility because sometimes we have to bring in people who are better than us or better at something than we are. And we have to recognize that and allow them the freedom to, to be great. Um, a lot of coaches, well, some coaches, I'll refrain, some coaches may be scared to do that because it's a threat. And then they hire somebody who is lesser in order to make sure that they are greater, which is a problem. You do want to have similar core values and philosophy. If you have somebody who has a completely different philosophy, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people who have a shared philosophy, but maybe just great at something within that. Number 20, um, this is a famous quote. I'm not going to read it, but Theodore Roosevelt came up with it. And he talks about um, this idea of just, just being, just having daring, going for something, being able to, to really go after it rather than just settling for that's good enough or that's okay. Uh, and he was a wrestler, uh, if you didn't know. Um, but this idea of just going for it again and again and not giving up. This is an interesting one, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna say this one carefully because it depends on what level you're coaching. Uh, but but leaders develop the 80 percent. Understand this. Um, our leadership is not found in, in our authority. It can be, right? Our title can dictate something, but it's more found in the influence we have. And there's this idea, and it's, I've seen it both in sports and business, called the 10-80-10 principle, where 10% of the group you work with are just great. They're self-starters. They work hard. They don't need motivating, et cetera. The vast majority of your group are 80%. They're the ones who will do the work, but they kind of need some cajoling. They need some guidance, et cetera. Then you have 10% who often don't really care that much. They like being on the team for the image. They're okay sitting on the bench. When you ask them to do a set of 10, they'll do nine and see if you're looking, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the argument here is don't worry about the bottom 10% because Typically what happens is most coaches spend most effort on the bottom 10% because we want to save everybody. We want to motivate everybody. And then we forget about the top 10% and the other 80%. Um, we want to work with the 80% by combining them with the 10% to maybe get 20%. So this, we, we have to do this by making them believe it's worth it, making that 80% believe it's worth it, making it something special use the top 10, maybe pair them up with somebody in the 80%. We try to provide ownership, give them choices and create an environment where there's positive peer pressure. The idea behind, behind this is that if every team has a 10%, well, then you're competing against all the other 10%. But if one team has 20% and the other team has 10% and those 20% are absolutely going for it, then there's a good chance that 20% is going to be better than that 10%. So we have to make sure that when we do this, we look at how can we leverage the top 10% to help us with the 80%. And while I want my 10% in the bottom, I need them, they're valuable. I'm not going to spend all my time with them trying to bring them up into the 80%. Um, that's an interesting one. I, I think it's worth a discussion about that one. Um, but that's something I've seen again, both in sports and, and business models. Number 22, they demonstrate extraordinary belief. Well, how do you do that? You have to have a vision. What do you want to achieve? We have to have a strength of will to, to overcome, which means we have to have resilience. We have to have a belief that initiates and activates action and inspires others. And we can then have a belief that achieves what others have not. We have to have that belief. If we don't have it as a leader, we cannot expect the people who work with us and, and for us and uh, maybe the athletes who, who uh, play with us, they're not going to buy into that if you can't do it either. 
So these are the things that you as a leader have to show in order to get people to buy into that. Uh, this is a recent one for me. Um, it's called Leaders Foster Range. And the idea, uh, the idea behind this is that leaders have to know more than just the specialty that they know. And I think this is a danger for coaches who are interested in one sport. And in this case, we're talking about soccer. So they know soccer and they do all their licenses in soccer and they do all their certifications in soccer and they do all their professional development in soccer. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with doing a lot of certifications and training in soccer. That's important. But they're learning everything within soccer, but ideas can come from outside of soccer. And if you don't do any training outside of that, maybe in other sports, maybe talking to leaders in other areas who, who work with different groups, you may not learn as much as you could. And I think there's a danger that... Um, we as a uh, society have become very, very specialized, which means we don't always see that big picture that I talked about before. So we need to really think about focus, not rethink focused knowledge. Um, my degrees at the time I, I thought were a mistake. I have, I'd think a minute, I have four different degrees. Um, five. <laughs> I have five different degrees in five different subjects. And at the time, I thought that was a bad idea, right? In my 20s, what you, that I should be focused on this thing. But it's really allowed me to see how different disciplines in, in sports science work together to, to help develop an athlete or help develop a coach. So we need to rethink our focus knowledge. Um, we need to avoid this thing called cognitive entrenchment which is the act of experienced individuals and group becoming rigid under pressure and regressing to what they know best. So when, if you're coding and things are stressful, you go to what you know the best because you're under stress as opposed to maybe making the right decision because it, you're comfortable with that. Uh, it's why, for example, when athletes are, are under pressure, their technique breaks down because they go to what they know best. And so they go to maybe what they learned is when they were younger. And then you as a coach, look at them. What, what, what was that? I've never seen that before. And they don't know either. Well, it's because that, that was something they learned and had to unlearn, but under pressure, they went back to the thing which they learned the most. Um, so we need to expand our learning. We need to learn outside our areas of expertise. Uh, I read a, a lot of books and a lot of, a lot of, well, some of them aren't sports related, but a lot of them are across a diverse range of sports, which is why you're seeing quotes in this from all different people, because we can learn from all different people. We need to consider that we, how we hire people and recruit people. We need to diversify. Uh, we need to understand that different people from different countries, from different backgrounds can bring something new that maybe we don't know. So we maybe mix up our log logistics. Our last speaker was talking about how, you know, making three goalies in, in, in a game for fun. Mix it up. Create an environment for that athlete to figure that out. We need to drop the axe. And the idea behind this is uh, there was a study done of firefighters, and they found that the, a lot of firefighters have perished in fires, in forest fires, because they wouldn't drop their axe. And so the axe weighed them down. They weren't fast enough to get out of the fire. And they felt like the axe was just an extension of them and dropping it was just a no-no. Well, what do we have, which actually is the axe? Is there anything that we need to let go of, which will free us to allow us to maybe be more creative or maybe try that new job or um, hire that person we weren't thinking about? What is it holding you back? We have to drop the ax. We have to support exploration, trying new things, new ideas. And then I, this is a one I think goes against what we see in society. We have to foster the jack of all trades. Well, jack of all trades, historically, we kind of see as a negative, right? They're good at uh, you know, some things, but they're not really a great at anything. The actual phrase is a jack of all trades is a master of none but oftentimes better than a master of one. So can we, can we look to becoming better at more things without becoming expert at one thing, which then limits us because we can't see how things fit together. 
Uh, I picked this quote up actually yesterday and, and it was like, yes, this re reinforces what I was trying to say. Kenneth Frazier is a, a, a business guru. Ultimately, I realized that what's most important is to be a learner. Many people know a lot about a little, but there are few people who know a little about a lot. And we need, I think, as coaches and those of us working in sports, we need to know a little about a lot so that we see those big pictures. A uh, last one is uh, that leaders do their research. This is a quote by John Quincy Adams. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. And then over on the right, Albert Einstein said, seek to reach the stars. And even if you fall short, you will have climbed higher in the attempt. Now, the problem with these two quotes is that they're wrong. The one on the left, actually, I believe was Dolly Parton who actually said that, even though you'll see John Quincy Adams online. And the one on the right is actually one I made up and actually use in my class to show the dangers of just show, sharing things on social media. In fact, believe it or not, somebody on, on Facebook is using this as their profile picture. Well, we need to understand that if we don't do our research, and this is, this is cute, right? We're talking about quotes. But if we're coaches and we're not doing our proper research, but we're just doing this, this training program because so-and-so said it was good, or I saw it on Twitter uh, and it looked interesting, how do you know it's any good? Have you done the research? Have you actually investigated to find out if it's effective or whether it's age appropriate? These are areas that, um, that I think are, are important for those of us in leadership. We have to get it right. We can't make those mistakes. Uh, last thing on leadership. I love this quote from Paul Coffey. He was a, a hockey player and a Hall of Fame guy. He said, leadership is one of the sports intangibles. Guys can score. Guys can fight. Guys can skate faster than anybody else. But not everybody can say, follow me. And I think that's a challenge for us as leaders. We, we want those people where we say, follow me. They're willing to do that. So let me ask you, if you're watching this now or later on YouTube, um, what qualities do you have that would make you a great leader? What are you lacking? Uh, what can you improve through your decision making, through your effort, through your learning uh, and through asking for help? These are areas where we all have to ask ourselves on a regular basis, right? Just even though I hold a leadership position, I still have to do the same thing. I still have to find ways to learn. I still have to work hard when I don't want to. Um, I have to make rational, sound decisions, difficult decisions sometimes. Uh, where can I improve? What things do I need to get better at? Um, who do I need to ask for help? Can I have a mentor? Uh, I, so these are questions I think all as, as leaders, we should be asking ourselves regardless of what level we're coaching or regardless of of what sport we're working in or at what administrative level. So uh, I'm done. This is my contact information. You can reach out to me at my email address. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well. I should mention, of course, if you don't know already, that we do have a YouTube channel where I do regular interviews with sports professionals around the world. Uh, once About once every two weeks, I interview somebody and uh, I hope you find those useful as well. We also do a newsletter. If you go to tinyurl.com forward slash FSU coach newsletter every month, I, I send it out today, but every month we do distribute a monthly newsletter where we break down some research. We have a thought of the month and we just provide some education for coaches and sports professionals. Now is an opportunity to take some questions. Let's see what's in the chat box. I'm going to... Um, minimize this. No, I'll just leave it up for now just because it's me. Um, question was, what advice would you give an athlete trying to build a culture when they're surrounded and influenced by a toxic culture at home? Well, that's not an easy one. Um, an athlete can be a leader in two different environments. And in one environment, they may not be able to be the leader they want to be, for example, at home, right? Where maybe you aren't the person in charge. Maybe you don't set the direction of your home life. But that doesn't mean you can't do it 
at in your team uh, as an athlete. As that athlete, it's going to be hard, but understanding that when you come into this team, you have an opportunity to maybe be different, maybe to stand out, maybe to be who you want to be as a leader can, can really be a, a help. And also in some respects, develop a family environment there that you may not have at home. Hard to answer without knowing specifics, but I think it is possible. And I think that, that a lot of athletes see sports as an opportunity to escape uh, that, that kind of culture at home. The key for that athlete, though, is to not take the negatives that happen at home and bring them into that sport, because then that creates a toxic sports environment as well. And then what does the athlete have but two toxic environments? So it's really that attitude of I have an opportunity here to to do and be what I would like to do and be at home. Um, so uh, good question. Hard question. Don't know that I have a perfect answer for that. Uh, any other questions? I see some comments, but no questions. Okay. Well, that concludes uh, our uh, coaches clinic. I hope everybody has enjoyed the, the sessions that we've put on for everyone. Um, just a reminder, these will be up on YouTube in a playlist. I uh, hope you enjoy them. Hope you reach out to the speakers and thanks everybody so much for watching.